Hey everyone, Dr. Palmer here. Today's lecture, we will be discussing Douglas S. Massey's um, chapter uh, one uh, from his book, Categorically Unequal. Just to remind you a little bit of context, Massey is a sociologist. So remember, he is looking at quantitative data and large subsets of information. Um, and theorizing based on the information that he is receiving as well as the historical context um, through which he is examining. A few questions for you to consider while you are reading and uh, possibly watching this lecture. Um, there are only four, so it's not uh, overwhelming. The first is uh, I'd like you guys to think about your ascribed and achieve statuses. Um, what are they and um, can they be changed? Those things that are ascribed, um, can they actually be um, in a different context or time? Can they be changed at all? Um, the second question is, are achieved and ascribed categories universal? Three, how do our perceptions of people affect our judgment? Um, so when I talk about people, I'm thinking about um, looking at like the ascribed and achieved statuses that people hold. So for instance, um, one of my achieved statuses is that I am a PhD, right? I'm a doctor. Um, does that change the way people look at me um, or the way I look at myself? For some it does, for others, um, maybe not. So just think about that um, when, yeah, you're going through this um, presentation as well as like just in your daily life. And then finally, um, how do these things um, affect our society, the larger um, realms in which we interact. As always, we have vocabulary um, that we'll focus on. Um, this is just in alphabetical order and it is not necessarily the way it appears in this slideshow. However, these are terms that you will encounter through the reading. So part of um, Massey's um, writing is dedicated to this idea about biases, right? And um, implicit associations. So things that we hold in our minds, um, ideas that we hold about people that are you know, in the back of our minds that don't necessarily come to the forefront. But when we see those things, when we see people, when we see um, items that maybe we're not familiar with, we have a snap judgment. And so um, in this course, um, one of the things that you will be um, charged with is taking implicit association tests that were developed by Harvard University to um, find out what people's biases are. Now remember, we all have biases, um, and that is part of what allows us to be a successful human species. Um, so before you take those tests, um, you are welcome to watch any of these three um, video links um, on YouTube and get a little bit more familiar with what the implicit associations test um, is and how, you know, what it might say about you. So as an anthropologist, um, I always like to bring up other people, other anthropologists. So um, anthropologists uh, like to study various things in human culture, but some of the guys that studied um, the structure of human societies are, um, like in 1861, Henry Maine wrote about social status of traditional societies and how they contrasted with contracts of modern industrial societies. So um, let's say traditional tribal societies or primitive first peoples. Um, uh, Henry Maine argues that um, they were dictated, their human relationships were dictated by mechanical mechanisms. 
So um, where you were born, um, the, the family you were born to, the clans that you were born to, um, the uh, caste maybe that you were born to, that dictates who your relationships are going to be with um, throughout your life. Whereas in modern industrial or post-industrial society, which is where we are now, we don't necessarily make things, but we um, serve people. Um, we operate, human individuals operate more from a an organic um, relationship status where depending on your your personal interests um, your personal achieved statuses um, and partly your ascribed statuses but that can be um, you know there's more flexibility there in modern industrial societies um, it is more organic so who you bump into because of um, maybe how you dress or what um, interests and hobbies you have. That is what um, one of the distinctions between traditional um, primitive or first people societies um, versus modern industrial societies. And not to say that in our contemporary societies we don't have those two interlinking um, uh, mechanisms in action to form our individual human relationships. Um, and then we have discussed how Sir E.B. Tyler and Lewis Henry Morgan um, classed human societies and cultures on an evolutionary um, basis uh, based on the hierarchy of complexity of the um, social structures and material items that the culture has. Um, which went from top down, civilized, barbarian, and savage, and then the sub subdivisions of high, middle, and low um, civilized, barbarian, and savages. And then finally, we have Emil Durkheim, 1895, who is the father of modern day um, sociology. Um, and he theorized that all human beings have the capacity to classify. And the first thing that human beings classify are other human beings. And um, Ruth Benedict also um, discusses this in her work, Patterns of Cultures. So in thinking about achieved and ascribed statuses, um, we're going to look at uh, what a patriot is, the definition. Um, and part of the reason why uh, we're going to do this is because um, it the, the idea of patriot is very important within our own American society as well as um, other nations. Um, and um, it allows us to understand um, from a, an objective point of view, an objective scientific point of view, um, people's actions, right, um, based on their cultures. So. Um, the dictionary definition, the first one of a patriot, is a person who loves, supports, and defends his or her country and its interests with devotion. Um, the second definition is a person who regards himself or herself as a defender, especially of individual rights against presumed interference by federal government. And so um, one of the quotes that is often misattributed to um, the author of Common Sense, who is Thomas Paine, um, who a lot of our founding fathers um, looked to as inspiration, is, quote, a patriot must always be ready to defend his country against his government. So this actually um, puts patriots, um, pits them against their government, um, as opposed to um, a patriot fighting for his government, which is a very different way of um, very two very different definitions. Um, what Thomas Paine actually said is society in every state is a blessing, but government, even in its best state, is but a, necess a necessary evil. In its worst state, an intolerable one. For when we suffer or are exposed to the same miseries by a government which we might expect in a country without government, our calamity is heightened by reflecting that we harness the means by which we suffer. So think about um, what a patriot is. Is it um, an ascribed status? Are you born with it? Or is it something that you achieve? And what exactly 
um, do you need to achieve in order to um, meet the definition of patriot within your belief system and your cultural group, whether it be American, um, Russian, um, Christian, Muslim, uh, Buddhist. Uh, think about what a patriot's um, actions should be. Another one of those statuses that could be achieved um, and depending on um, how a contentious an action was could actually be ascribed because of a person's last name um, is traitor. So the dictionary definition of traitor is a person who is not loyal to a friend, duty, cause, or belief or is false to a personal duty. Um, another definition, number two, is a person who betrays his or her country, a person who commits treason. So in this slide, um, we have multiple um, examples of people that could be considered as traitors. Um, depending on what point of view you are taking. Um, and I'll just give you a little bit of a rundown on who these people are. Um, so at one point in time, just know that all of these people were considered to be traitors. The first example is on the top left, um, you have Sachin Littlefeather, who was an Apache actress um, in the 70s. And she was chosen by Marlon Brando, who is featured in the circle above her, um, who was receiving an Oscar in 1973 for his role in the Godfather gangster movie. Um, Marlon Brando was, um, you know, kind of upset and disappointed at what was happening to happening to Native communities. Um, and the abuse that they were suffering um, at the hands of the U.S. government. And so what he did was actually use his privileged space as a white man um, who is famous, and he um, sent Sachin Littlefeather to the Oscars and um, got her to read his decline of the Oscar um, uh, award because of the um, wounded knee um, standoff that was going on at the time. We'll talk more about this um, later. If you'd like, you can click on the link and that will give you some more information. But um, long story short, Sachin Littlefeather, when she read Marlon Brando's Decline of the Award, she was booed because she was criticizing not only the Hollywood industry um, on behalf of Marlon Brando, but um, she was also critiquing the United States government's um, action toward Native people. Um, again, in some cases, she was considered a traitor, hence the booing. Um, in other cases, uh, some people took both um, Marlon Brando and Sachin Littlefeather as patriots because what they were trying to do was bring to public awareness and injustice that was going on um, to a people that have been overlooked and trying to make the, um, the government and the film industry more aware of their complacency um, and their actions that um, further abuse people. Um, and so again, this idea of traitor versus patriot, there's a very fine line. Um, the next um, example is um, Sinead O'Connor, um, who in the 1980s, she was very popular. Um, she came out with an album, um, The Lion and the Cobra. Um, one of her most famous songs is Nothing Compares to You. Um, an Irish singer 
Um, she performed as the musical guest on Saturday Night Live. Um, and before she sang, she held a picture up of the Pope at that time of the Catholic Church, Pope um, John Paul II. And what she did was she ripped it up. And basically, that pretty much almost blacklisted her. Um, she got threats from um, big people in the Catholic community. Uh, of course, the Pope um, and, uh, let's see, uh, Old Blue Eyes, Frank Sinatra, um, because uh, what she was doing was seen to be blasphemous. Basically, the reason that she did it was to confront the... Um, the pedophilia that was going on um, in the Catholic Church for a long time and their cover-up of the abuses. Um, and so this picture is actually um, from a performance that she was doing in Madison Square Garden in New York City, um, where it was a tribute to um, folk singer Bob Dylan and um, when she went out on stage, she was booed for a minute or two, and instead of singing the tribute song that she was going to sing, she stood there, took the boos um, in a very brave way, because she was considered a traitor. Um, and instead of singing her planned tribute to um, Bob Dylan, she actually sang Bob Marley's song, War which um, decries the abuse of um, slavery and um, people of color and um, the abuses that um, the subaltern, um, which is the anthropology, um, social science um, terminology for people that are overlooked. Um, and she sang it in a stance to um, kind of a David and Goliath story about one person standing up to um, the abuses of a giant um, entity, right? Um, and Chris Christopherson is the man that is holding her and, um, you know, telling her to stand strong. Um, there is a video link of that uh, performance if you'd like to see. And it's actually very touching. Um, so yeah, one man's traitor is another man's freedom fighter. Um, and then just real quick down at the um, bottom left, you have Peter Norman, um, Tommy Smith, and John Carlos, um, who um, stood in the 1968 Olympics as a award medalist to um, stand up against um, the abuses of the um, their government. So. Um, the um, bronze, I believe it's the bronze medal winner or the silver medal winner, um, Tommy Smith, I believe is his name. No, no, Peter Norman, I apologies. Uh, Peter Norman was an Australian and he was standing up for indigenous rights and um, civil rights of people. And he um, wore this pin for United Nations that was speaking out against the abuses of human rights of um, first world nations. Um, Tommy Smith and John Carlos were um, American award winners um, who were standing up for, uh, with their black power fists, um, for civil rights. Um, and then we have the Olympics, um, Muhammad, or sorry, the Muhammad Ali, again, 1968, who was um, drafted for the Vietnam War and decided, nope, I'm not going to go fight people who have nothing to do with abuses against me. Um, I'm going to go kill, I'm not going to go kill them in a faraway land. Uh, they've never called me the N-word. They've never um, trampled on my civil rights. And so by... Um, you know, dodging the draft, he got five years in prison um, and a $10,000 fine. And actually, at this time, his name was Cassius Clay. Um, hence, fans write off Cassius. He was considered a traitor 
because at that time, um, 1968, civil rights was a contentious issue in the United States, right? But because of what he believed in, because of um, where he was at in his life, who he was, the color of his skin, and also his, um, his privileged place as a um, first-rate boxer, he was able to um, actually take a stand. And it's actually in prison where he converted to Islam and um, his name became Muhammad Ali. And a quick um, fact about Sinead O'Connor, just to connect these two um, very different people, um, Cassius Clay and Sinead O'Connor, those were their given names, and they both um, turned away from their uh, Christian backgrounds to Islam be as, um, to, as a stand up against um, the church and their abuses. And then finally, we have, um, Jesse Williams in 2016 with the BET Music Awards. Um, 2016, we had um, uh, Colin Kaepernick um, kneeling down to protest um, the abuses, the continued abuses of um, African Americans. But basically, what Jesse Williams said in his um, acceptance speech for BET Awards kind of much like what Marlon Brando and Sachin Littlefeather did. Again, these are all people using their places of privilege to um, speak out against um, abuses um, from a larger entity and were considered traitors, right? But are they traitors or are they patriots? It really depends on where you look. Anyway, um, uh, Jesse Williams, he stood up and basically said, um, it's not the job of the abuse to comfort the bystanders and the abusers. Um, we have to critique um, and make the world a better place and you know, bring to light the abuses. Otherwise, they're just gonna continue. Um, so a lot of people critiqued him for using that platform. Um, a lot of people also uh, critiqued him in the African-American community because they were like, hey, you're light skin, you're green eyes. How dare you talk about abuses when you have a place of privilege? But again, he's taking this place of privilege and um, using it to um, you know, make the change that he wants to see in the world, right? Um, and real quick, back to Peter Norman with regard to his um, standing in his place of privilege, him as a white, um, you know, as a Euro-Australian um, man, um, a world-class athlete. He was actually blacklisted in Australia um, and he was kind of barred from actually ever um, like making any sort of money off his athletic skill because he stood up and spoke out against human rights abuses. Um, and unfortunately, he died, um, you know, like uh, in an, um, ambiguity and um, kind of in poverty because of, um, you know, taking that simple stance. So um, this idea of traitor and patriot, it, again, it's a very thin line. And, um, you know, even having the name of somebody who stood up can either like really prop you up um, in the world, or it can bring you down. <laughs> There's, you know, consider um, the name of Hitler and how many people um, that you have encountered with like the name, even Adolf. Um, so yeah, you can maybe it, it's argued that you can be ascribed as a traitor, uh, um, as your status, um, and achieved. So yeah, consider this in your daily life and, um, let's continue on with the discussion. So one of the things I really like about what um, Massey does is he talks about the human brain and our capacity um, and the anatomy and uh, why our brains work the way they do. Um, if you are a human being and you have full capacity of your brain, then yeah, usually it's, it's pretty standard, right? Um, this is the way we think. So the prefrontal cortex and the neocortex um, deal with logic and rational thought. So it allows us to think, it allows us to make decisions, and it allows us to create, right? The limbic system um, deals with the emotions. It is where pleasure and pain are processed. And there are also, it's also, <laughs> it's also important for us to note that um, 
pleasure and pain um, are processed in that same part of the brain. So prejudice, when we look at prejudice um, or racism um, as a specific type of um, prejudice or sexism, ageism, they're all emotional responses to a generalized type of experience. And usually this happens um, within we get our first experience and either we have a positive experience with um, things or we have a negative experience. And so this creates um, a conscious and subconscious components um, in our reactions to different things. So let's say um, I, when I was, I was burnt by a cup of coffee and I was like super burnt and I had to go to an emergency room. My parents freaked out. And, ah, there was a lot of drama around it. There were lights, you know, the ambulance came, cops came. Maybe I was removed from my home because um, uh, Child Protective Services thought I was being abused. And so every time I see a cup of coffee or a cup, um, I might be triggered back to that moment. I might have no conscious idea of that. Um, but every time I see a cup of coffee, I might freak out, right? Um, so I have a bias against that coffee. So the same exact things can actually happen with human beings. So let's say um, if I was, oh, if I, um, well, I'll just take my own um, self into consideration. Um, I am biracial, technically, right? Um, by American standards. So my mother is colored from South Africa. She's brown skinned. Um, and my father is German Sicilian, light skinned from Connecticut, um, the United States. Um, so I grew up seeing um, all shades from ginger, the whitest white person, right? To um, very dark skin, dark eyes, dark hair, curly hair um, in my uncles. And to me, to everything in between, right? Um, a whole range of, um, from Snow White to um, a caramel um, cafe con leche to, um, dark chocolate, right? Um, and that's actually how I used to classify people when I was little. Anyway, um, because of that, I don't really have a racial bias because I had positive experiences with all these people. Now, had I been solely of one race, like white or black, um, my first, and if I had a positive experience um, with all of those people, hmm, I would have a, I would be um, biased to have a positive bias to people, or I would just be kind of indifferent. Um, if uh, I had a negative experience with either or, um, every time I saw a white person or a black person, I might um, have my default reaction to that negative reaction um, when seeing other groups of people. So again, um, these, um, these foundationary experiences that we have as youth that are constantly um, reinforced by the interactions that we have with other people, the media that we consume, things that we are told by our um, parents and our schooling, our education, uh, constantly reinforce uh, either our uh, positive biases to things or our negative biases to things, right? And so this um, all leads up to implicit associations. So um, this is part of the reason why we classify all human beings according to appearance, but it can also be by smell um, and sound, right? Because these are all just emotional, emotion, emotional responses to sensory information. So with this knowledge that we are kind of programmed from an early state um, to have specific biases in our lives, it allows us to, um, again, um, scientifically and objectively look at um, the preferences that we hold as individuals and as societies. Um, and uh, Massey talks about how our brain is limited in its capacity. Um, and because it's, you know, like there's all these, you know, I guess urban myths, how human beings only use a certain smidgen, uh, like 20% of your brain. And um, man, if we could use 100% of our brain, we'd be able to levitate, we'd be able to do all these like amazing um, extra human things. In reality, we're um, 
in our waking moments, only a smidgen of our brain is working. Um, another part of our brain is resting, and when we go to sleep, there's you know other parts of our brain that shut off and then others that are turned on. Um, there's parts of our brain that um, we unconsciously use or subconsciously use to um, run the organs of our bodies. Like most people do not consciously um, regulate their heartbeat or their pancreas or their stomach, right, or their intestines. Um, to do so would actually um, um, maybe send us into brain overload. And actually, um, if a person uses up to 100% of their brain um, in their waking hours, that is actually called a grand mal seizure, um, an epileptic um, seizure, right? And so um, in our conscious thinking and in our memories, we are kind of limited in our memories, what we do is we chunk. And so um, we piece little bits of information into larger bits of information, which allows us to access um, um, you know, our filing system, if you will, in a much better way. If anyone has seen the Stephen King uh, movie, uh, Dreamcatcher, uh, that is a perfect, there's like some scenes where um, this uh, kind of otherworldly character, Duddits, um, has this group of friends that he trains to um, men mentally or telepathically communicate with each other. There's um, this alien, another alien life form comes down and is trying to take over um, human society. Um, but first they take over individual beings. And so he takes over this one individual being um, and the person's, um, who, the person's body who he's taking over. Um, uh, he goes into his memory filing system and you see like this big library and the files that he holds and all the um, filing cabinets, they're chunked of different memories. It's a great um, kind of visual for you guys if you've ever seen it or if you're interested in Stephen King, uh, check it out. It's an okay movie. But anyway, um, when we um, group the information in at least like small bits of information into larger bits of information, it allows us to um, uh, recall them a little bit easier. So um, in looking at mnemonic devices and why they work so well, this is why. So um, in looking at unchunked um, bits of information, we have um, a bunch of different states that are here um, listed. It, it'd be hard to just kind of randomly organize them in our mind or memorize them in our mind. Um, but if we chunk them together as like East Coast versus West Coast, it makes them a little bit more um, digestible, right? When we look at Roy G. Biv, um, which stand for, you know, it's just one name. It looks like a name, right? A Western name, Roy G. is his middle name, and then Biv is his last name, his surname. Um, but it is just an acronym for the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And then the solar system, um, as you see, we have um, different names for the um, planets listed, which enables us to access the information much easier. Status. Massey talks about two types of status. You have a scribe status, so those that a person is born with, and then achieved status, those that a person worked and earned. Um, and so down at the bottom, I have a few um, images of different statuses that may or may not be ascribed or achieved, or some might be a little bit problematic. Um, and so I ask you to think about um, which of these statuses are achieved and which are ascribed. So we have graduates, students, um, we have Caitlyn Jenner, um, and you can argue, like, is her status achieved or is it ascribed as being a woman, right? Um, and this is not always true or universal within um, all places and times, right? Um, we have the, the royal British um, princes, Prince Harry and the other prince whose name I cannot recall at this moment, but um, 
are is their status achieved um, by being royalty, um, or is it ascribed because they were born into it? Um, is being men is it a, an achieved or an ascribed status? Um, Olympic gold medalist achieved or ascribed? Um, Manny Pacquiao achieved or ascribed? Um, as boxer, um, president, um, man. Think about it. And then looking at um, some other cultures, this is the Zulu culture. Specifically, um, this is the Shembe tradition. Um, Shembe is a syncretic religion that is based um, on a combination of Christianity and traditional Zulu beliefs mixed into one. Um, these are um, groups that in the far left corner you have um, young men, again, achieved or ascribed. Um, and then the next picture to the right is um, uh, married women, again, achieved or ascribed. Young women are in the middle. Um, there is a craftsperson, a craftsman um, to the uh, second from the right. And then finally, you have the, um, the men um, or warriors. It can be argued um, as long as you have uh, good reasoning that any of these are both um, achieved or ascribed or one or the other. So Massey discusses how in um, many of our industrial societies and post-industrial societies, there are social hierarchies, um, which are basically he terms stratification. And stratification means it is an unequal distribution of people across social categories and are characterized by differential access to scarce resources. Um, the word stratum in archaeology refers actually to the layered um, patterns of earth that are distinctive in their compositions and they are temporary, temporarily so time-based, um, temporarily associated. Um, and there is a top-down layering of stratification and social hierarchies. And if you think about the 99% movement uh, fighting against the unequal distribution of wealth in the United States um, that is held by 1% of the population, or again, the summer protests of 2020, um, looking at the unequal distribution of not only wealth, but healthcare, um, justice, um, policing in um, uh, black uh, communities, um, we can see that there is an, un an unequal distribution um, of resources, be it justice, um, wealth, um, access to health care, job security, et cetera, et cetera. And this idea of social stratification um, runs pretty much universal throughout human societies. However, the way it looks and the way individuals act within those cultures and societies differs. Um, first and foremost, the stratification begins psychologically, and this is what Massey argues, and it represents um, the cognitive boundaries that divide human beings from each other. Massey, Massey argues that we are all mentally hardwired to, um, to classify people and to classify things based on um, whether they will do us harm or bring us pleasure, right? And so um, because um, he looks at how the brain works and that 20% of our energy is actually devoted to um, um, to just running our bodies. Um, that is the reason why we actually have these little chunking schemas and shortcuts to make our brain work a little bit more efficiency. So our brain is acting not to optimize decisions necessarily, but it's acting to construct categories about the world in which we live in to show, oh, these are good, these are bad. Avoid this. Um, 
move towards that. Um, and so yeah, think about um, what you know, what things that repel you and what things draw you to them. And when we look at um, Massey's um, chart about um, warm, apt people um, versus inept, cold people, that chart that he has, um, it shows us, um, at least in our contemporary society, um, the social stratification and who we consider are loving, caring, um, and smart, and who we consider are um, dumb, dangerous, um, and um, cold people. So one group, the, the first group that are warm, caring, and smart, those are people who are more like a parent. They are um, considered of all the faculties um, and rights of a human being, whereas that cold, calculating, dumb person um, is dehumanized. And so just a quick note about um, how our brains work and to be more happy. Um, I ran across an article a few years ago, which I like to bring up, about um, how brain science um, tells us how we can be happy. So um, basically, um, one of the things, it, it make the decisions that make you feel good. Um, and they say, you know, striving for perfection is great and all that, but um, it can lead to undue stress. And so sometimes just making a decision that's good enough can actually um, allow you to um, be more happy. So rather than um, optimizing, we just want to like make a decision, name it, and move on, and that will help us flow in our lives much more easily than picking apart each and everything that we encounter. And a little bit of a Marxist as I am, um, I really like uh, Massey because he talks about resources. And um, resources are a big motivating um, fact within our human lives. And this is also universal. Um, so there's three types of resources that Massey brings up. Emotional, so love, affection, and or sex, which allows us to reproduce, right? Material, um, which um, encompasses wealth, income, food, and land, which allows us to be comfortable, um, maybe also allows you to reproduce, right? Um, reproduce in children and um, like the influence you have um, in the world. And then symbolic, which um, encompasses prestige, respect, and or social standing. In other words, cultural capital. Um, so think about the different resources that you uh, strive for um, and the different things that, um, the different resources that people either have or don't have and how it has led to strife in our world and how it has maybe um, led people to solve problems um, uh, to get those resources and create harmony within um, our society. Massey also talks about um, some political and um, economical divisions in our societies. So taking from Kotek, um textbook uh, written in 2011, anthropology textbook, he um, talks about how anthropologist Elman Service in 1962 divided uh, four levels of political organization um, into human society. So first of all, you had band, um, which were like no more than 12 people. Um, and they were kin based, so everybody was related um, through their sanguine or marriage ties, sanguine meaning um, blood ties. Usually they were hunter gatherers, and um, pretty much everyone's kind of equal, right? Then you had tribes, um, which is another grouping of people which involved village life, organized again by kin groups, but based on clans and lineages. Um, there was a lack of formal government um, and that were non-intensive food production, 
um, usually involving pastoralists, so raising animals or horticulture, which is um, you know, gardening um, or low intense agriculture. Um, chiefdom is the third level, which is socio-political organization between tribe and state. The relations are based on kinship, marriage, age, generation, and gender. And there is a division of wealth and unequal access to resources. So here um, we get more of a division of society um, where you have more haves or less haves and more have nots, right? And then finally, um, in where we are in our contemporary um, modern day um, the United States, you have state, which is organization based on formal government structure and socioeconomic stratification. Again, related to organic um, mechanisms of human relationships, not necessarily mechanical. A little more on social stratification. Um, we have a temporal aspect of um, the uh, social divisions. Um, along with um, the type of division and the lifestyle. Um, I will allow you guys to kind of mull this over yourself, um, but just because we're living in the post-industrial society of 1970s now, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, hunter-gatherers do not exist and, and that there are not um, a variety of intersecting and interlinking um, lifestyles and types of divisions that are overlapping within our contemporary society. Hence, in our postmodern world, which anthropologists call the contemporary time where we're living in right now, um, everything goes. Um, so you're living with hunter-gatherers that have real-time cell phones and they can do videos, but they're still living um, like uh, people, you know, maybe 10,000 years ago. Um, but you still have this intersection between the highly technological and the um, not so highly technological, if you will, or the more earthy um, type of people. So one of the notes that um, Massey brings up is how mechanization and the Industrial Revolution really changed our ideas of social stratification. So mechanization made production systems much more rationalized. And think of the Industrial Revolution in England um, and Fordism of the 1920s to the 1960s within the United States. And um, this mechanization of human production allowed people to produce more things um, and it specialized people. Um, and what it did is it also spurred urbanization as people moved from the farms to the cities. So you have less agriculture um, and people depending on the land and more people depending on cities and also interdepending on each other. Um, what this urbanization also did and this mechanization also did was it dehumanized people. So instead of being um, a specialized carpenter or a specialized um, um, cobbler, where people had to go to you and they knew your name and you know you knew everybody around um, and and if you passed on you know you were a loss to the community now if you're a lost uh, if you're a lost worker you die you pass away you get maimed um, it's real easy to just pick somebody else up and put them in your place because you're just a cog in the system um, and so, yeah, people became less uh, human and just became means of production and very replaceable. And that's where we come up with this Marxism idea of, you know, the exploited masses versus the um, the, the the rich um, industrialists, industrial capitalists, right? And we see this argument constantly coming up with, you know, um, these. Um, protests that um, are constantly coming up um, for the working class um, fighting against the um, oppressive non-working class and rich. Um, and then um, we also see within this time the increased social stratification which creates more wealth at the top and less wealth um, down at the bottom. And if we look at what has happened within the pandemic, we have CEOs like Elon Musk um, and um, Jeff Bezos of 
Amazon um, getting richer and richer and richer as people keep on um, using their um, services to um, consume. Um, and the you know service workers, um, people who work essential jobs are eking by um, and uh, putting their lives in danger um, of a pandemic. Um, and it's just created more and more of a wealth gap. And then when we look at how um, gender is also represented, um, we see more women uh, having lost jobs during the pandemic and having to, because um, if they've had, if a couple, a nuclear family has had um, uh, school age children, it is um, oftentimes been up to the woman to, And so I paused, and where am I at? Um, yeah, so let's move on. And the stratification process continues. Massey argues that there's a combination of two things. First of all, the allocation, the act of distributing something, so a resource, either emotional um, status or material. Um, and that can be through um, the social categories, the statuses that we hold, race, gender, class, and think about if there's anything other that you would add. And then institutionalization, the action of establishing something as a convention or norm in an organizing culture. And quote, unequal practices that allocate resources unequally across these categories, end quote. So when we think about healthcare, education, judicial system, leisure, employment sector, um, this is not a comprehensive list and it is again also not universal because different cultures, different nations have different um, institutions and different classifying um, uh, classifications of individuals ascribed and achieved statuses that um, they will hold as norms and therefore um, distribute those resources. So how we judge, um, again, we have our competent um, in-group, our in-group, um, it's us, it's not them. And then we have our cold out-group, right? Um, objects of envy. Um, they're competent, but uh, we don't necessarily like them because they don't, uh, they're not friendly, right? Um, in the United States, we have um, Jews, Asians, the 1%, right? Um, female professionals, female CEOs, these are considered competent, but cold, right? Um, the incompetent, um, but warm, they're the nice people, they mean well, um, but they're not so competent. Um, the elderly, disabled, mentally ill, and then you have the incompetent, cold, that are society's outcasts, right? The poor, the homeless, substance abusers, maybe minorities, um, and the list goes on and on. Again, this is not a comprehensive list. So to conclude, the human brain is wired to categorize, to conserve energy um, by making snap judgments based on previous knowledge and experience. And it's actually only through study um, and having positive experiences with those things that maybe we were um, having negative experiences with before that can break those biases, right? Um, and social distinction depends on, on the type of human society that people live in. So whether you live in a band or a tribe or um, a nation, um, it's going to be, have different um, social categories. Um, and different ascribed and achieved statuses. Also, the resources um, will be different. Um, you'll still have emotional status and material resources that are kind of the universal, but how they actually appear will be different, right? Um, and as our societies grow larger and larger with more and more people, more and more variety, um, there is increased stratification developed as human um, societies grew and members become more or less specialized and mechanization is increased. 
These snap judgments are based on implicit biases and are apparent within the structures of our institutions because our institutions are just reflections of the human beings that exist within them. And then more often than not, we look favorably on people that are more like us than those that are less like us. And again, it's only through work that we um, are able to see different cultures and different people as human um, than, than if we just kind of exist and continuously just, yeah, hold people for 